concludes portfolio questions. We'll turn now to our next item of business, which is a debate on motion 7750 in the name of Alec Rowley on finance. And I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Alec Rowley to speak to and move the motion in his name. Thank you, President Officer. Presiding Officer, when delivering her speech on the programme for government two weeks ago, Nicola Sturgeon said the time is right to open a discussion about how responsible and progressive use of our taxpayers could help us to build the kind of country that we want to be. I welcome that statement and Labour in this Parliament uh, will work and engage in our country to actively engage in a discussion on this issue. In that speech, the First Minister said, and I quote, the quality of our schools and hospitals, the safety of our streets and communities, the supply of skills and good housing and infrastructure are just as important as rates of tax in growing our economy and attracting investment into Scotland. Nothing there I would disagree with. But I would suggest that the levels of funding available needs to be sufficient to ensure that we can achieve those high quality services and facilities. And that is the question at the core of this debate. For all these areas of public services, after 10 years of SNP government, we do have major problems and issues that must be tackled. The government cannot simply ignore this nor can they legislate their way out of the challenges when many, not all, but many of the solutions require more resources to be made available. So, for example... Murder Fraser. I'm very grateful to Mr Rowley for giving way. His party will have a position on tax very different to my own party's, but at least it sets out his view. Does he not think it's a bit rich for the Scottish Government to ask opposition parties to set out their stance on taxation when it won't tell us what its own stance on taxation is. Alec Rowley. I will, I will, um, I will come to, to the point about the Scottish Government. Um, so make it, making the point about resources and not being able to legislate your way out, an example of that is that, that you can bring in new legislation as the government is doing to set targets to eradicate child poverty. But unless you take direct action, the targets will be meaningless and the goal of eradicating child poverty will be nothing more than wishful thinking. On education, you can legislate, you can restructure, you can create more bureaucracy in the process, but unless you address the cuts to the school budgets, you will not tackle the core issues. 4,000 fewer teachers today than when the SNP came to power. 1,000 fewer support staff than when the SNP came to power. Class sizes bigger today than when the SNP came to power. Spending per pupil across all ages is down. If pupil spend had remained the same as in 2010-11, primary schools would be £726 million better off and secondary schools would be £308 million better off. There are wider issues to be addressed in education, but at the core of the school problem is the cuts. And so when discussing tax, how much we raise matters, but it is also about how governments spend taxpayers' money, the choices that governments make. And on that note, I did read with interest the paper published earlier this week by Professor Jim Gallagher. The paper, Public Spending in Scotland, Relativities and Priorities, reached the following conclusions. Scottish health spending has not kept pace with overall devolved spending. If it had, it would now be around £1 billion per year higher. Increased spending on health has been a lower priority than in England. And as a result, English health spending per person has caught up closer to Scottish levels. 
Spending on Scottish schools has slipped over the past decade, with English spending catching up despite devolved spending on public services being around 25% higher per person. So when we talk about tax, we cannot do so in isolation from spending choices that the SNP government have made over these last 10 years. We would suggest... Yep. Kate Forbes. Alex Rowley then welcome our amendment in this debate today, which calls for cutting the 1% pay cap and bringing an end to austerity. Alex Rowley. <laughs> we would suggest, therefore, that part of the national discussion we want to have on tax includes a discussion around the priorities for Scotland in these difficult times. A priority, the pay cap, is something that's welcomed. It has to be paid for. On Friday of last week, the Herald newspaper carried an article stating that the Finance Secretary was asking other parties to send him their latest income tax plans in order to open up discussion on preparations for the draft budget. The point I have already made is that we need to consider spending alongside considering taxing. It is also important to look at income tax in the context of other taxes, and we must consider what other policies the government have that can increase the tax take across Scotland. Over, our view is that the Finance Secretary must drop the proposal to cut air departure tax by 50%, a tax cut that will cost the public purse nearly £190 million. That is a £190 million tax break that Scotland cannot afford whilst our public services buckle due to a lack of finance. This Parliament must also unite around the demand to the UK Government to remove our police and fire services for pay from paying VAT. Police Scotland pays between £23 and £25 million in VAT annually. Scottish Fire and Rescue Services pay approximately £10 million in VAT annually. Now, I know the SNP were repeatedly warned about what would happen on VAT, and that's a fact. But nevertheless, we are where we are, and it is not right, and we must stop this unfairness. The Treasury's principal argument is that because we have moved to a national service, VAT must be paid. However, the Police Service of Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service are national services and they do not pay VAT. And since Police Scotland came into being in 2013, several national agencies that operate in England have been given VAT exemptions. So we need the, that VAT exemption for Scotland and I do hope that all parties in this Parliament will unite around a call on the UK Government to sort this and to sort this now. Returning to the FM's, the First Minister's speech for Government, Nicola Sturgeon also said, our new planning bill will also help to secure the housing development that the country needs. I do not think it will help unless the Government gets to grips with the problems that are stalling development right now. It is not just the planning system at fault. It is the lack of upfront money to deliver the infrastructure that will enable development like roads, schools and health centres. We need to work with the industry and local authorities to find a way to overcome the barriers, including the very real barrier of front-loading infrastructure costs. We need a national house building strategy, local delivery plans and a skills strategy for Scotland. And we need the investment to make all these things happen. For presiding officer, the more people we get skills for, the more jobs we create, the larger the tax take we have. So it's not just about increasing tax, it's about increasing the numbers of taxpayers and it's about increasing the total tax take for Scotland. But can I say, presiding officer, I was pleased to hear the First Minister has committed to publish a paper on tax before the budget to influence the discussions with other parties. 
Labour has said that we should use the powers of this Parliament and we did publish our tax proposals for last year's budget. We said that we would put a penny on the basic and higher rate of taxation and introduce an additional rate of 50p for those with over £150,000 a year in order to invest in public services. We set out what this would mean for people and let me set it out again. If you earn below £21,000, I'm sorry, I have to make progress. If you earn below £21,000, you would not pay a penny more in income tax now than you did last year. If you earn £28,000, you would now be paying just over £1 more a week in income tax. This is £65 a year. If you earn 41,000, you would now be paying an extra £3.90 a week in income tax, just over £200 a year. Anyone earning 61,000, like MSPs in this place, you would now be paying an extra £10 a week under our proposals, £526 a year. And if you are a government minister earning £90,000 a year, you would now be paying £17 more a week, around £900 more a year. At a time when we desperately need investment in our public services and in driving Scotland's economy, it is right to consider using the taxpayers of our parliament in a progressive way, ensuring that those who are able to pay a bit more do so. The SNP, the SNP has voted against introducing a 50p top rate of income tax on the highest earners eight times since 2015. Analysis confirmed by the Scottish Parliament Information Centre shows that Labour's amendments to the two previous budgets for 1617 and 1718 would have raised just over £1 billion in additional tax revenue compared to the tax plans that were passed by the SNP. Using data provided by HMRC, it is evident that not only has the total income of wealthier people in Scotland, that is those earning over £150,000, increased by 68% between 2011 and 14-15, but the number of wealthier people almost doubled between 2010-11 and 17-18. Now, I'm not opposed to wealth, but those who have a bit more must surely be asked to make a bigger contribution towards a better Scotland on the grounds that they can afford to do so, and it benefits all of us if we live in a more fair and more equal society. So we say, it is no longer acceptable that the SNP government protect the richest whilst cutting services for the poorest. A millionaire, a millionaire has paid less than £2 a week extra in income tax because directly of SNP policies. We are happy to present our tax policies to the government and enter into a discussion. But on one thing we are clear, they need to change theirs. Exactly 15 years ago, when the NHS faced enormous problems, it was our Labour government that stepped in and doubled the budget. Today, many of our public services face enormous problems, and there is a desperate need for investment in services in people and in infrastructure. It is time once again to make the case for a tax rise. For those who can pay a bit more to do so through a progressive tax system and to build a more fair, more just and better Scotland. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I call on Cabinet Secretary Dermot Mackay to speak to and move the motion in his name. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to debate income tax policy this afternoon. Discussions on income tax will form an important part of our wider engagement as we work to present our draft budget to Parliament later in the year. And as we know, this is a Parliament of minorities. And for consensus to emerge, there must be compromise. And for compromise to be found, there needs to be a recognition of the responsibilities that we all share. 
And for the government's part, we enter into these discussions on tax, like the other parties, with a set of manifesto commitments. But we recognise that if every party simply votes for their own position on tax, we will have stalemate. This parliament of minorities needs both a responsible government and a responsible opposition. As we announced in the programme for government on the 5th of September, the government intends to publish a discussion paper on income tax. This will, we hope, facilitate an open and constructive debate about how we ensure the sustainability of our public services whilst giving certainty to taxpayers. Of course. Really ready. I'm interested in his discussion paper because it makes a reference to it in his amendment. But I'm interested in the timing. Could it mean that we could have tax increases in this coming budget? Or is it his intention that this paper is not concluded until the following budget? So are we going to have to wait until 2019 before we see any real change? It is sense. my intention that this discussion paper enables debate for this budget. And in that regard, I encourage all political parties, including the Liberal Democrats, to engage positively in that debate and in that paper. And then we can make progress. If Murdo Fraser will allow me to make more progress, I'm just in to two minutes with page two of my uh, speech. Let me uh, make further progress. But we look forward to publishing this and encourage all political parties to engage. And to facilitate this discussion, at decision time tonight, this government will not, with the exception of opposing the Tories' attempts to impose further austerity by reversing the tax decisions we've already taken, take a position on the amendments from Labour, the Lib Dems and the Greens. I want there to be an open and constructive debate, and so I and my colleagues will not prejudge the outcome of that discussion as well as the political discussions like the one we'll have this afternoon with politicians, we're also planning engagements with business, trade unions and third sector organisations. We will commit to using this national discussion to help us ensure that our tax policy continues to help Scotland to be the best place to live, work and do business. And we are living in times of austerity. Despite the transfer of further responsibilities, Scotland's total Dell Block grant allocation will be reduced by 1.4%. That's £411 million in real terms over the next two financial years. And between 2010-11 and 2019-20, the Scottish Government's discretionary budget will have been cut by £2.9 billion in real terms. Now, the UK Government's approach to austerity has been neither fair nor progressive. And while the Prime Minister lectures the country on the need for austerity, she has found an extra £1 billion to buy the support of the DUP to keep herself in power. And at the same time as the Tories have cut budgets, capped welfare payments and introduced policies like the bedroom tax and the rape clause, they have cut corporation tax, capital gains tax and inheritance tax and increased the threshold at which those at the top end of income pay the higher rate. And we have always been clear, we had not at this point, we have always been clear, we do not and will not support the UK government's toxic approach to tax breaks for the rich, paid for by vital cuts and vital services. We have been similarly clear that we will simply not pass on the burden of austerity onto the poorest members of society. And it is for that reason that whilst we will not prejudge the discussion on taxation, we will not support the Tories' amendment today which seeks to reverse last year's tax decisions and render useless the tax powers this Parliament has. And as we begin preparations for the 2018-19 draft budget process, which sets the rates and bans of Scottish income tax, this Parliament does have the opportunity to debate the future of Scotland's public services. But this will not happen in isolation. Whilst it is true that an increasing part of our budget will be decided here in this Parliament, we cannot and should not ignore the impact of the UK Government's budget on our funding. And whilst the Labour Party seem to suggest to ignore what's happened at Westminster, our amendment makes it clear that we demand of the Chancellor the following. 
an end to austerity, a lifting of the 1% pay cap, and a fair deal for the nations and regions of the UK, not the grubby deal for the DUP. And whilst we debate, and whilst we debate income tax, we cannot lose sight of what this Sorry, tax is Sorry, Minister, there's a point of order for. from Mr Findlay. Point of order, Mr Findlay. Member in this Parliament. And isn't it clear that Mr Mackay has adopted the Ruth Davidson rape clause approach? That when you're on a hiding to nothing, you just keep your head down and keep reading a pre-prepared speech like a speak your weight machine? It's entirely within the Cabinet Secretary. He has already taken an intervention. What Cabinet an Secretary. appalling contribution to such an important matter, the tax rates in this country. <laughs> and how we fund the public services of Scotland. If the front bench want to intervene, I'll take an intervention now. James Kelly. Uh, thank Mr Mackay for taking the intervention. Do you not think it's time that you come off the fence and supported increasing taxation in order to alleviate those hundreds of thousands of people who rely on the public sector in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. It's time. I think it's time for opposition politicians to behave responsibly and come to an informed decision as to what's right to deliver stability, stimulus and sustainability of the public services of Scotland. And that's exactly the approach we will take by engaging with politicians, yes, but wider Scotland eh, in that eh, fashion. And I would say to the country, that all taxpayers in Scotland benefit from access to more free at the point of use public services than are available in the rest of the UK. And this will help us attract the best workers because of the excellent quality of life living in Scotland can deliver. And protecting our public services is also why we have announced a lifting of the 1% pay cap, ensuring that future policy will take account of the cost of living and protect those workers in our public services. But as the First Minister set out in her programme for government statement, we know that in the face of continued Westminster austerity, the consequences of Brexit and demographic change, there will be increasing pressure on those public services. This is why now is the time to enter into this debate on how we use our income tax powers to help protect our public services and ensure that they remain sustainable for the future. As with all our tax powers, I am committed to developing a progressive tax policy. And we are committed to keeping progressivity at the heart of our income tax policy, as we believe it is right for those who can afford to contribute the most that they continue to do so. So in conclusion, I return to the need for this parliament to engage in meaningful discussion, offer your suggestions, play your part in this debate, this government's approach to tax is the responsible thing to do, and I ask members of the opposition to do likewise in order that we may find the common ground. Thank you. I now call on Murdo Fraser to speak to move the amendment in his name. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by welcoming the fact that the Labour Party have allocated their debating time this afternoon to a discussion on tax? Well, those of us of a certain vintage will remember all the discussions in previous years around whether this Parliament should have tax uh, raising uh, powers uh, and, or, and be able to debate uh, raising uh, money as well as simply spending it. And it's the devolution of additional tax powers to this Parliament by a Conservative government which now allows us to have these fully rounded political debates with a Parliament that is responsible for raising a sizable proportion of the money it spends and has to consider the consequences of the tax decisions that it takes. So this is a welcome and timely debate, not least in the context of what the First Minister said when she launched the programme for government two weeks ago. And she wants a debate with other parties about income tax. Just last week, the Finance Secretary said he was writing to opposition parties asking us to set out our views on tax to help inform the debate. Now, in this party, we've always been quite upfront with our views. Our position on tax was set out clearly in our manifestos for the elections to this place in 2016 and to Westminster in June this year, and it hasn't changed. But the Scottish Government seemed remarkably keen on asking other parties for their views on tax, but remarkably coy when it comes to revealing their own ideas on tax. And I listened with great interest 
to what the Finance Secretary had to say just there, to try and get an inkling of what exactly the SNP are saying in this debate on tax, but I am none the wiser. So, in a second. So, the Scottish Government are expecting us to tell them what our tax plans are, but they won't tell us what they are actually proposing. It's a case of, you show me yours, but I won't show you mine. That's not the way to have a proper debate around these issues. But I'll give way to Gillian Martin, Gillian if she Martin. will tell me what the tax plans are. Mr Fraser, one of the things that I hear when I speak to the public, and I'm sure we all hear the same things, is that the public are fed up with politicians having entrenched positions on things. <laughs> and, no, I, and the, the, I wonder, if I, I wonder if I can finish my intervention. I've, I've fed up with public, uh, the politicians of all parties have, having entrenched positions and things. And surely we should all be welcoming the fact that the Cabinet Secretary is saying, let's have a dialogue about something so important. Yeah. Murdo Fraser. Can, can, can I thank Gillian Martin for that intervention, which makes my point for me. We are telling you where we stand on tax. All we're asking is that you do the courtesy of telling us the same in response. Why is there nothing from the Cabinet Secretary telling us what the SNP position on tax is when we are quite happy, and to be fair, the Labour Party quite happy to say where they stand on these issues? No, I'm, and, and yes, and to be fair, the Liberal Democrats too. <laughs> and probably the Greens too. Has that covered everybody, presiding officer? Thank you. So, I might fundamentally disagree, incidentally, with the Labour Party, but at least they are open. Now, uh, I will briefly, yeah. Alec Rowley. Does he accept that we should not be looking at income tax in isolation from other taxes and indeed spend? And will he and his party get behind the call that all other parties in this chamber have for the UK government to remove VAT from fire and police services? Well, that, Fraser. that is a discussion I know that is ongoing at the moment. I, I, would, I would simply say, and Mr Rowley will know this, that the Scottish Government were well warned in advance of going ahead with the mergers of, VAT, of, of police and fire services that VAT would be chargeable in those circumstances. So it's a bit much, a bit rich for them to come along and lecture us on these issues when they knew the consequences of their actions. Now, we've had a narrative from the Labour Party. We've heard it from the SNP too, about Tory austerity. And I've pointed this out in the Chamber many times before, but I need to point it out again. Because the Scottish budget, in overall terms, is not lower today than it was in its previous high point of 2010, as the Fraser of Allender Institute analysis makes clear. The Scottish Government's discretionary spend may be down on its previous high point of 2010, but compared to 2007, the year the SNP came to power, there has been no cut in the Scottish Government's discretionary spending power in real terms. And the Cabinet Secretary knows that is the case. And let's just remember, Ten years ago, we were ten years into a Labour government in Westminster with Gordon Brown as Chancellor, which wasn't shy of increasing public spending. So the idea that ten years ago public spending was running short is not reflected in the actual facts. So all the shrieking about austerity doesn't reflect the fact that we're in the same position in real terms we were in in 2007. And nor should we forget, presiding officer, that the Gerrard figures make clear that the level of public spending in Scotland is in excess of £1,400 per head of population higher than the UK average. I like Rowley referred to... Let, let me finalise this point and I'll, I'll give way. I just wanted to make a point, because uh, I like Rowley referred to Professor Jim Gallagher's uh, comments uh, from Nuffield College uh, on Monday, when he made, I think, the very clear point that in some cases, spending on public services in Scotland is 25% higher than it is south of the border. The problem is not enough of that money is reaching the front line. We should be spending the money better before we talk about raising more money. I'll give way to the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. I thank Murdo Fraser for giving away and I look forward to the explanation as to how to fund all these tax cuts. Which area of government, Scottish Government expenditure will the Tories choose to balance the books? Murdo Fraser. Derek Mackay has not been listening. If he'd looked at the analysis in the GERS figures, which I understand the Scottish Government supports by all the howls from their backbenchers about how discredited they are, if he looked at what Professor Gallagher had said uh, in the report that came out on Monday, the point he is making is this. There is far more money going into Scottish public services than is the case elsewhere in the United Kingdom, and yet in too many cases the outcomes are poorer. And the answer, therefore, Cabinet Secretary, is public sector reform, not putting your hands into the pockets of hard-working taxpayers across the country. That's what he's doing. I mean, I suggest he takes a leaf from the, from, from the book of his colleague, 
the Cabinet Secretary for Education, who is adopting lots of excellent conservative ideas on education reform about pushing money down to head teachers and giving them control of budgets. That's the sort of reform we need to see, Cabinet Secretary. That's the way we deliver a bigger bang for our buck. Um, I think, I'll give you extra time for well, intervention. I mean, I've already Mr. taken Peter. three It's a matter for you, of course. Oh, if I'm given extra time, of course I'll give way. Cabinet Secretary. It, but would Myrtle Fraser not reflect on the point that actually we increase spending to education directly through the attainment fund in the fashion that Myrtle Fraser is suggesting? And the Tories voted against that as well. Myrtle Fraser. I, I, don't, I don't recall us voting against the attainment fund per se. We voted against his budget because his budget was putting his hands in the pockets of hard-working Scottish families. And the point is, you have plenty of money, Cabinet Secretary, you just choose not to be wise in how you spend it. And before you start raising more money from hard-working Scottish families, start using the money you've got better. So, what we should not be doing, uh, presiding officer, is raising taxes anymore. We've already seen an income tax differential in response to the programme for government. We saw business organisations like Scottish Chambers of Commerce, the Scottish Retail Consortium, expressing their concern about the impact that further tax changes would have on business and the economy. The Scottish Retail Consortium said any notions about increasing income tax rates should be firmly knocked on the head as it could cast a pall over consumer spending, a mainstay of the Scottish economy. And the irony of the SNP rhetoric around this is that they are all over the place when it comes to tax. Because on the one hand, they talk about a debate around increasing personal taxes. On the other hand, when the Finance Secretary stood in this Parliament uh, just last week talking about business rates and announced a whole range of new exemptions in terms of business rates, which of course we welcome, he explicitly accepted the argument that business rate exemptions would help business and therefore help grow the economy. They're arguing, of course, for cuts in air departure tax, a very sensible policy because that will grow the economy. John Mason, the man not usually shy in making the case for increased taxes, even put down a motion in Parliament last week supporting a case for a reduction in air departure tax. Can you so please, one week can you please conclude? No, I have given you extra time. Please one conclude. week they're arguing for tax cuts, presiding officer. The very next week they are arguing for tax rises. Thank they you. need to make up their mind, presiding officer. I have pleasure in moving the amendment Thank you very in my much. name. I now call Patrick Harvey to speak to and move Amendment 7750.3. Mr Harvey, seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Always a pleasure, of course, to follow Murdo Fraser in, in a debate from the, the political party that entered office uh, delighted and, and tickled pink, in fact, to have a note saying there's no money left. He's now said, you've got plenty of money, Cabinet Secretary. There's plenty of money. We're awash with money, apparently, and we just need to spend it differently. I, I really don't think that stacks up. Uh, can I uh, acknowledge the way that uh, Derek Mackay has, uh, and indeed the First Minister, has opened a debate, a discussion, uh, on taxation. I wish, of course, that we'd been there two years ago or more when the Smith Commission agreed that income tax rates and bans would be devolved. That's when we should have begun the open discussion about immediately, as soon as those powers are available, taking uh, a more creative approach. However, we are where we are. Uh, and uh, Derek Mackay is correct when he uh, said in his speech that if all parties just dig their heels in and stick to their manifestos, we'll get nowhere. Well, it's a point I made to him uh, in the letter I sent to him uh, on Friday in response to that call for submissions. Uh, I said it would clearly be impossible for a coherent tax policy to emerge if all parties stick doggedly to 2016 manifesto positions. Uh, and that's clearly going to be the case. If we want to make progress, all political parties that seek a more progressive tax system are going to have to be able to uh, enter this conversation with a constructive spirit. And, it, and to expect the same from the Scottish Government, to be fair. So I'll remind people of the Green Manifesto position, not in the sense of digging my heels in, but in offering this as our starting point. Because we began with some central uh, objectives. First of all, of course, to raise adequate revenue, and we believe that there is a need to raise more revenue in Scotland than is currently being raised in order to achieve the quality of public services people expect and demand. But also, a purpose of taxation policy must also be to close the inequality gap. Uh, and I think these two central objectives should be ones which all parties seeking a more progressive tax policy should be able to support. 
Uh, yes, indeed. Yes, you, Doug Dale. Thank the member for giving way. Uh, in light of his own party's position, does he accept that introducing a new top rate of tax wouldn't raise enough revenue to tackle the austerity he talks of, and therefore, if the government is serious about protecting public services, it will have to do something with the basic rate? Patrick Harvey. Uh, in indeed. And to, and to run through the changes... Uh, that we suggested to the basic and other rates, uh, we first of all don't accept the premise that in order to raise more revenue and close the inequality gap, we have to raise tax on all low earners. So our first acknowledgement was, of course, that the personal allowance is reserved. We can't change that. Not that we would wish to, not that we would buy into this rhetoric uh, around ever-increasing uh, personal allowances being progressive. They're not. They, the bulk of the benefit that goes from an increased personal allowance uh, goes to people who are higher than average earners. The basic rate, though, we should not constrain ourselves and say that that must remain a single basic rate for all time. Our proposal was to split it into two to reduce the first rate from 20% to 18, and to increase the second rate from 20% to 22. That would ensure that we put the tipping point, the point at which people start to pay a bit more tax, a bit more income tax, uh, at the level of approximately the average full-time salary in Scotland. Now, we based our figures on those that were available at the time in the run-up to the 2016 election, of course, and if they require to be revisited uh, we're obviously open to that. We then suggested an increase to the higher rate from 40% to 43 and to the additional rate from uh, 45 to 60. And I acknowledge that there's an ongoing debate, a discussion about whether those additional rate taxpayers would in fact be paying more tax, whether we would increase revenue or whether we would in fact increase tax avoidance behaviour, the kind of behaviour that I hope most of us would deprecate and want to prevent, but which we have relatively few measures to prevent in Scotland. But there is no evidence that I've seen, no evidence that I've seen that that tax avoidance concern is in any way relevant to the higher rate. There is some mixed evidence that it may be relevant to the additional rate, but there is not a reason uh, to refuse to increase the higher rate. Uh, and additionally, because of that second policy objective we have in our tax policies uh, of reducing inequality, I would say that even if the uh, increases that we propose at the additional rate only have the effect of suppressing excessive pay demands by the super rich, that is a good thing for society in its own right. Now, the effect of this, the effect of this, obviously those, below, those earning below the, the personal allowance would continue to pay no income tax. Those earning uh, £14,200 a year, uh, compared with uh, the rest of the UK as it stood uh, at that election period, would be paying £54 less per year in income tax. Uh, those earning £27,000 uh, uh, 710 would be paying £24 more a year. So it's that tipping point of roughly a full-time average salary. Those earning £40,000 a year would pay £270 more per year. Those on, like ourselves on MSP salaries would be paying uh, over £1,200 a year. And I refuse to accept that anyone on our very, very generous salaries cannot afford to make that contribution. I'm sorry that I didn't calculate uh, what the Cabinet Secretary uh, on his Cabinet Secretary's salary would be paying, but the highest paid public uh, post at the time was the Chief Executive of Scottish Water uh, being paid something in the order of £250,000 and he would be paying nearly £14,000 or more uh, in taxation. And on a quarter of a million pounds of income, I refuse to accept that such a person can't afford to make that extra contribution. Now, since this time, of course, Deputy Presiding Officer, we see increased inequality, we see increased public pressure on public services, uh, and we see the need urgently to end the public sector pay cap. And like Alec Rowley, I recognise that that must not just be done, but must be paid for if it's not going to result in more job losses in public services. But at the same time, at the same time as saying it must be paid for, if we pay for it by increasing taxation on lower than average earners, how much progress have we really made? How much better off will they really be if their pay goes up a bit and their tax goes up a bit as well to pay for it? Very briefly, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, the first half of the SNP's amendment uh, I, I have no objection to at all. The second half seems altogether too neutral. Uh, it also preempts our own amendment, so we'll vote against it. The Conservative uh, uh, 
amendment seems to be based on the principle uh, that there's no, never a case for increased tax rates in one jurisdiction than another. If it works one way, it works the other way, and it amounts to an opposition to the principle uh, of, t uh, of tax devolution. Uh, and the Liberal Democrat position, I await with interest. I hope it is not still predicated on increasing by a penny to all earners, including those below an average salary. I still see no reason why people on below average incomes should be asked to pay more Thank tax. Thank you. Please uh, conclude I move now. the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call Willie Rennie to speak to move Amendment 7750.27 minutes, Mr Rennie. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. This is a rather great opportunity to discuss tax, and I'm grateful for Patrick Harvey that he's read out the Green Party's tax code this afternoon, because we're all much more well informed as a result of that. But I think what we should be focusing on is the real principles behind the decisions that we need to take. Now, we will be engaging with the Finance Secretary um, on this year's budget. We'll do it constructively, just like we did last year, just like we've done it in every other year um, since I've been leader and before that too. Because it's important that with a parliament of minorities that we seek to work together wherever we can. We won't just agree to anything. Of course, we've got to have significant concessions from the Scottish Government to reflect the fact that they are not a majority in this parliament. And that's why we'll be putting forward our proposals. Now, we've um, set them out very clearly in election campaigns, and I'll proceed to set out our proposals uh, this afternoon. Um, I think it's, it is quite instructive to also learn about the other parties' proposals, because the Conservatives seem to adopt an approach still of a small state approach, cutting tax at every possible opportunity, irrespective of the consequences. Uh, the Labour Party seem to be in favour of increasing it, sometimes at every opportunity, no matter what the consequences. I'm not quite sure what the SNP position is, because their rhetoric, I have to admire them, their rhetoric is fantastic. They condemn the Conservatives for cutting expenditure, but then follow the Conservative budgets almost to the penny in, in our own budgets up here, despite the fact that we have many more powers in this Parliament, something that my party uh, was at the forefront of arguing for, and we were able to deliver in that great uh, coalition between 2010 and 15. Oh, and on that point, point. <laughs> I'll hand over to Murdo Fraser. On cue, Mr Fraser. Officer. Um, the point I was going to ask Mr Rennie is, would you, would you agree with me that this, this discussion we're having around tax, where all the opposition parties are setting out their tax plans, that discussion would be considerably enhanced and enabled if the Scottish National Party were to tell us what their tax plans are? Willie Rennie. I, I, I would slightly disagree with Murdo Fraser, because actually I think the fact that they're prepared to have this discussion is an indication that they're prepared to move away from their manifesto mm -hmm. commitment. So I think that is a significant point that the Chamber hasn't identified so far, and it's something that we on these benches would welcome. So I hope, actually, that it does indicate that. And I was pleased that the Finance Secretary, in response to my intervention earlier on, did indicate that it was possible that it could happen this coming financial year, that in fact we could have a change in the spring of 2018, as early as that. I had concluded that actually what the Finance Secretary was up to was to publish a discussion paper to trash everybody else's um, tax policies in, in advance of the budget proposals. But um, I, I don't think he's as cynical, he's not as cynical as that. So I don't believe that would ever have been uh, in his mind at all. Um, but there is an opportunity for us to perhaps push the Finance Secretary a little bit further so that he's actually prepared to move away um, from the manifesto commitment that he made only, only last year. So that's, a, that's an encouraging step. But so far, despite that tough rhetoric all the years in government, they've tended to follow almost exactly to the penny um, the budgets of the Conservative Party. So perhaps we might get a change this coming year, and that would be a welcome thing, because we might be able to get the investment that we're looking for. Now, Liberal Democrats are not in favour of increasing tax automatically at every opportunity or cutting tax at every opportunity. It's about a balance, and we do recognise it's a balance between public expenditure and personal expenditure. The ability of people to be able to afford to live their daily lives, as well as the government to be able to afford um, to provide the services that we all need and depend on. So it's a, our proposal on tax is a limited proposal not an indication of more to come, not a proposal to increase taxes right across the board as some others might prefer to do. So it's a limited proposal of a modest penny on income tax worth £500 million, 
which would invest in education. We would call it hypothecated taxes in order to invest in colleges, schools and nurseries because we have a fundamental problem with our education system. It used to be one of the best in the world and it's now just average and that needs to change. And we believe, we've sadly concluded, that we do need to raise more tax in order to put that investment into colleges, schools and nurseries. 150,000 places, not just now, 150,000 places cut from our colleges. The whole principle of lifelong learning has been abandoned by this government. We need to invest more in women and mature students as well. A pupil premium that we've advocated for years and eventually we got the Scottish Government to embrace the policy after condemning it all that time. We now need to catch up. We believe there needs to be more investment in the pupil equity fund as the SNP prefer to describe it. And then nurseries, one of the biggest revolutionary steps that I think we can take, the best educational investment of 30 hours for two, three and four year olds. We need to invest in buildings and also in the training of the staff to be able to fill those nurseries. Those are big expenditure items that will have a transformational effect on education, that will benefit the economy for the longer term by providing the skilled workforce that we need to drive forward standards in our society. So that's our proposal. And the reason why we are proposing a penny on income tax across the board on the basic rate is because that great Conservative Liberal Democrat government managed to increase the tax threshold, going up to £12,500. I've not heard many people congratulating us for doing that exact proposal. But as a result, as a result of that, you'd have to earn something like £20,000 before you would pay a penny more in tax as a result of this from one year to the next. Somebody on £100,000 would be paying 30 times more than somebody on £21,000. That's quite progressive, and I believe that's why we can afford to do this and protect those on low incomes and those who ignore that deny the facts. Now one final point I'd like to make, just a bit more information from the Finance Secretary on his discussion paper. We've had an indication of when this is going to be published, in time for possibly this year's budget. But I want to know who's going to write this? Are the special advisors going to have a role? Is it going to have conclusions? Is it going to have a narrative to it? Or is it going to be evidence-based? Is it going to be facts and figures? Or are the SNP special advisors going to put some kind of spin on it? What I'd like to do is the basic facts to be presented so we can all draw our own conclusions to inform the debate. I am deeply worried, deeply worried that the SNP use this as an opportunity just to shape the other party's proposals and, propo and promote their own proposals instead. So I'd like some reassurances from the Finance Secretary on that. Thank you. Please move your amendment. Please move your amendment, Mr Rennie. I don't oh, you move sorry. it. Move the amendment Thank you. Yeah. I have only three minutes in hand for interventions. I want to give people opportunity to have extra time for interventions. But once that's run out, take an intervention and it has to be within your five minutes. Uh, Jackie Bailey, please, five minutes. With only five minutes, presiding officer, I'll dispense with the niceties and cut to the chase. Because if you want decent public services, you need to pay for them. If you want the best possible education, good schools, top quality teachers and well-resourced classrooms, you need to pay for them. And if you want the best possible healthcare, a well-resourced NHS, where staff are valued and patients are at the heart of all that you do, you need to pay for that too. But if you want to end austerity, which the SNP has chosen not to do, if you want to stop being a conveyor belt for Tory cuts, you need to make different choices about what you value. Presiding officer, it's not rocket science. Had Labour's proposals on taxation been accepted, <laughs> this parliament would have raised an extra one billion pounds over the past two years. That would have ended austerity and invested in the public services we all value. Of course. Is Kate Forbes. Member, sorry, does the member think that somebody on 12,000 pounds a year should pay to end Tory austerity? Look, Jackie somebody Bailey. on 12,000 pounds a year would not have had to pay to end Tory austerity. You could have made choices in government that actually ended Tory austerity. You chose, deliberately chose, not to do so, and Scotland should not forgive you for that. Because I well remember it was Nicola Sturgeon who rejected those proposals, saying it would not be radical, it would be reckless. It would not be daring, it would be daft. Now, a mere 18 months later, the First Minister has changed her tune about tax. And is that because there is a yawning gap in their budget? Because after all, they start with having to find at least £190 million just to stand still. 
Derek Mackay's sleight of hand last year was to bundle together underspend, which had yet to be reported, financial transaction money, and changes to the budget exchange mechanism. All of this for one year only. And then there's the SNP spending commitments for the years ahead, an increase in health spending by 500 million, maintaining real terms funding for the police authority, doubling childcare provision. And then there are the commitments to higher and further education, reducing the attainment gap, concessionary travel, although I think you might be moving away from that, greater welfare spending. What's the price tag for all of these things? Now in 2016-17, there were projections for a budget cut of three to 4% in real terms by 2021. I heard the Cabinet Secretary use a different figure, but it would be useful to have clarity on Scottish Government forecasts for the next few years to inform discussion about the level of taxation that might be required to close that gap. Now, I've heard rumours emanating from the Cabinet Secretary's office that he's looking for an extra £600 million. That's the scale of the cuts we would face. I noticed he didn't like my suggestion, presiding officer, but neither did he deny it. To cover that cut in the budget, to cover that cut in the budget and new spending commitments could mean that some unprotected areas of the budget, um, no, because you weren't fast enough. You weren't fast enough, so please listen. Some unprotected areas of the budget could face cuts of 10 to 17%. That's simply staggering. So no wonder the SNP now want to talk about tax. And then, presiding officer, there is the ending of the public sector pay cap, something Labour campaigned for and strongly believe in. And I'm pleased that the Scottish Government have finally come round to agreeing. But if you take a 1.5% pay rise across the Scottish Government areas of responsibility, the civil service, NHS, police and fire, that could cost an extra £150 million each year. And already, Already, there are requests for much higher rates of pay. And that figure doesn't even include local government. So I am disappointed, however, that despite the additional powers over revenue raising, the SNP amendment focuses in part on the UK government. And I hope that the SNP is not suggesting that a pay rise in Scotland is conditional on what the UK government does, because that would I will indeed. That would be letting workers in Scotland down very badly indeed. We'll have to be brief. The members coming into the last few minutes, the last thank, minutes. Thank you very much. Unlike the Labour Party in Wales, this government will lead by example, and we will not wait to see what the UK government does on lifting the pay cap. Jackie Bailey. Well, I very much welcome government action. It follows years upon years of the Cabinet Secretary and his predecessors writing writing to the pay bodies saying that the cap at 1% should remain. So we will wait and see what you do. Presiding officer, the SNP government need to tell us the size of the cuts that are coming this year. They need to share with parliament the scale of the spending pressures and they need to set out their taxation proposals. Isn't it interesting that the only party in this chamber that has yet to set out their proposals for taxation is the SNP? And that's simply not good enough. The SNP amendment is weak, it's wholly inadequate, and it's truly pathetic. But what I will give you is that it's consistent. Blame somebody else, ask others for their ideas so that you can copy them, and when all else fails, presiding officer, dissemble, hide behind assertion, rather than taking action. Thank you very much. Now, other members, Kate Forbes, we're followed by Bill Bowman. Five minutes, please. I'd like to start, presiding officer, by thanking the Labour Party for being so quick and willing to work with the Scottish Government on tax matters. It's been less than a week since Derek Mackay announced the government's intention to hold a big discussion on taxation, and the Labour Party, uncharacteristically quick to collaborate, has used the first debate slot to do exactly that. And perhaps we will be able to help the Labour Party think through its own position on tax. It talks about wanting to increase tax. Is that in line with the Scottish manifesto, the UK manifesto, or something in between? The Conservatives have been, on the other hand, characteristically less welcoming, condemning us for not prejudging the outcome of the discussion. 
and I want to spend my time touching on two issues. One, the limits of income tax as a single tool to transform the Scottish economy, and two, the importance of growth. Because this new discussion on taxation is, of course, only one side of the balance sheet, and we generally spend more time in this chamber debating the other side, what kind of country we want to be. And that's what our amendment highlights this afternoon. End austerity, become the only government in the UK to lift the 1% pay cap and provide certainty for taxpayers, public services and the economy. And I can only presume that Labour will welcome this wholeheartedly, despite their own government in Wales not lifting the 1% pay cap. And whatever we agree or disagree on this afternoon, I know from the debates that both the Conservatives and the Labour Party have held in this chamber, in their own time, that we all believe it's important to invest in the future. Take housing, for example. This time last week, the Conservatives called for more investment in housing. And they've done the same on health, on education, never mind all the portfolio questions on funding for other issues. And they're perfectly entitled and commendable to do this on behalf of their constituents. But I would like to know where, how they expect to pay for it, because cutting taxes is not going to help. Cutting corporation tax... Murdo Fraser. I'm much obliged to Kate Forbes for giving way. I wonder if you read the analysis from Professor Jim Gallagher of Nuffield College that was published on Monday in relation to the Scottish budget, where he made the point that uh, headline spending of Scottish public services was far, far higher than that uh, payable south of the border, and yet outcomes were substantially poorer. Does that not suggest there is scope for spending money more wisely than we are currently doing? Kate Forbes. Well, I think it does make an important point about the fact that the priorities of the Scottish Government is to ensure that money is spent on health and education. And he, the murder Fraser is quite right to comment that public spending, particularly on the NHS, is higher in Scotland because that is a devolved matter. But of course, we do need to continue having that discussion on how we spend money. And if we can start with a bit of collaboration around tax, and hopefully we can, start, we can continue that collaboration around other areas of the economy because cutting corporation tax, capital gains tax, inheritance tax and increasing the threshold for those at the top end of income tax will not pay for that increased investment we want to see at the cutting edge of public investment. And even, um, no, not, thank you very much. And so the purpose of the discussion on taxation and of course our discussion on taxation is pretty narrow. It's essentially around one tax and we only have half the powers of that tax. Income tax is just one tool in the toolbox and we've only got powers over rates and thresholds. I'm sorry, I'm going to keep going. We don't have powers over the personal allowance, gift aid or other allowances. We don't have powers over savings or dividends. And in terms of the full toolbox of taxation, we don't have powers over capital gains tax, corporation tax or inheritance tax. And of course, taxation is only one fraction of our budget from devolved taxes. I'm not going to mention that our overall budget continues to be reduced, as Murdo Fraser admitted, as a result of austerity. I'm going to use the Tories' own argument in calling for economic growth. But you can't grow by cutting. The UK government's approach to our economy has been weak and unstable, and it has huge consequences for every nation in the UK. The, the, current members, condition, the member will be closing shortly, she's in her last minute. The current condition of the UK economy is a very, very poor advert for austerity. After years of politically motivated austerity, we have slow growth, rising inflation and low wages. In June, the UK economy fell to the bottom of the EU Growth League as the first quarter figures of 0.2% GDP growth was lower even than Greece, where growth was 0.4%. But it's against that challenging backdrop that productivity growth in Scotland is outperforming the rest of the UK. We have secured more FDI projects than any other parts of the UK outside London, and the unemployment rate is close to a record zero. So we will continue to grow the economy, we'll have a frank discussion about taxation, and we'll continue to invest in the future of our country by calling for an end to austerity. And I'd like to point out that I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. There is now no spare time in hand, so interventions will have to be absorbed within the five minutes that members have allocated. I call Bill Bowman to fall by John Mason. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Let me begin by recognising that the parties of this Parliament 
have a common purpose, even if we disagree how best to do it. We all want to see a fair tax system that allows us to support world-class public services. On these benches, we don't believe the way to do that is by saddling hard-working Scots with ever more taxation. What we should be doing is working to boost the economy and grow the tax base to generate bigger tax receipts for longer. And I welcome the comments from opposite earlier about that. For example, we might debate the detail, but I welcome efforts by the SNP to cut the air passenger duty to boost tourism and Scotland's participation in the global economy. So too would I have welcomed efforts from the SNP to avoid raising income tax. Last year, just before the Scottish Parliament election, the SNP promised to freeze basic rate during this Parliament, increase the higher rate threshold in line with inflation, and Nicola Sturgeon even called suggestions to increase the, dash, the additional rate well, daft. Uh, let me make some progress, please. Thank you. But fast forward, and they have now refused to rule out a basic rate increase, have said they're considering increasing the additional rate, and have sold off their higher rate commitment to buy green support for their budget. Sadly, this is the sort of opportunistic approach to policy that we have come to expect from the SNP, more concerned with boosting votes than the economy. And the economy certainly needs a boost after a decade of SNP economic failure and the constant threat of constitutional uncertainty. Compared to the UK as a whole, Scotland's growth has been sluggish. Businesses face enormous rates increases and we narrowly dodged a recession earlier this year. To make matters worse, the SNP have given Scotland the dubious honour of being the most heavily taxed part of the UK. Con Cabinet Secretary. Thank Bill Bowman for taking the intervention. Um, can I ask Bill Bowman, who spent uh, two minutes talking about the SNP's position, can you explain the position of the Conservatives Party on income tax specifically? Bill Bowman. Um, thank you for that intervention. I think I've covered that, but let's contrast that with the two and a half million Scots, two and a half million Scots who can keep more of their money thanks to the income tax cuts by the UK Conservative government and our commitment that Scotland should not have a higher tax burden than the rest of the UK. Both the IFS and the Scottish Chambers of Commerce have warned against the SNP's higher tax agenda and we believe that such warnings should be heeded to ensure Scotland is not put at a disadvantage. I'm sure there is no shortage of ideas on how to use Scotland's tax powers to boost our economy, and I know that Mr Mackay has been in the Herald asking for such ideas. Given the hints that he might soon raise taxes, it would be a welcome development if the Cabinet Secretary is serious about engaging with different opinions, because whenever taxation is raised, this chamber loses one of its great strengths, its diversity of ideas. That diversity is all too often replaced by a two-party system, the Scottish Conservatives and the left-wing consensus. You, <laughs> <laughs> we, we see it playing out already. In addition to having increased taxes last year, the SNP are threatening another assault on workers' pay packets, with Labour and the Lib Dems cheering them on, whilst the Greens tax plan seems designed to wage war on any and all disposable income that we have. Time and again, we hear them together whistling that same sour tune, tax and spend but as the tune Scots don't want to listen to. A recent poll found that only 13%, I think I'm, that found that only 13% support an increase in the basic rate and 44%, fewer than half, thought the higher rate should be increased. Even raising the additional rate didn't go down well with just a third thinking it would boost the economy. The left-wing consensus sells Scotland short because they have already decided on the answer before asking the question. It isn't should we raise taxes, but by how much? It isn't how do we get the best value for taxpayers, but how much more can we spend? Where is their outrage at the 178 million spent on the SNP shambolic CAP IT system, which is now 75% over budget? Or at the five million court fines written off? Or at the hundreds of millions in LBTT revenues that were not generated as expected? That is money that could have gone into critical public services and it shows why we need these debates to move beyond simply assuming tax rises. We believe in working with others where there's common ground, but we also believe that Scotland is ill-served when common ground turns to ideological dogma. Scotland's workers can't afford a parliament seeking to pick their pockets. Increasingly, people recognise that it's only the Scottish Conservatives who offer a genuine alternative to the high tax agenda put forward by the other parties. We are already delivering for Scottish taxpayers at Westminster, and we want to see a fair deal for them here at Holyrood 
And now you must conclude. No, now you must conclude. Must conclude. I'm moving on. I call John Mason to be followed by Neil Finlay. Mr. Mason, please. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Clearly, a tax can be too low so that we can't afford decent services, or it can be too high so that people move out of the country or go to great lengths to avoid and evade tax. So, in amongst all the heat and the rhetoric, we're trying to find the right balance today and over the coming weeks between the level of tax and the level of expenditure. Now, I certainly have heard some people say to me that they are prepared to pay a bit more tax in order to protect valued public services. However, it's true that I've also heard constituents say that it is unfair to raise taxes when costs are going up and wages have been largely static. The SNP has been reluctant to increase income tax, especially for low earners, and this is especially the case uh, for very low earners, who face a marginal rate of 32% when income tax and national insurance are combined. And this is especially unfair when additional rate taxpayers and 45% are only paying 2% NIC, giving a total of 47%. We certainly do not have a very progressive system at the moment when the lowest rate is 32% and the top rate is 47%. So my first point would be that if we were to design a truly progressive income tax system, we need control of both national insurance and income tax and treat these which are both income taxes as one. However, that is not where we are at the moment, and we have to consider what we should do with the powers that we do currently have. And as a parliament, we are all going to have to compromise a bit if we are going to get a budget through this year. No one party is a majority, and as we've heard already, no one is going to get all that they put in their manifesto. However, I do think there are some clear majorities in this parliament, and in fact, Bill Bowman spelt them out just now. The Conservatives are a minority in this parliament. The Conservatives are a minority in this country. The Conservatives have support from a minority of people in the public. So it is probably the rest of the parties who are going to have to get together and have some common sense and reach an agreement that will be acceptable to the majority of people in Scotland. When we're having these debates, it's good to remember, uh, too, that we look back to the past. On Saturday's Herald, I was reading a book review uh, on a book called Bread for All, The Origins of the Welfare State by Chris Rennick. I have to say I've not read the book, just the review. The review reminded us of Beveridge arguing for a welfare state in 1943 and how the top rate of income tax reached 90% after the war and was still 83% in the 1980s and only fell to 40% under Margaret Thatcher. Now, I do not think even our most left-wing colleagues are advocating either 83 or 90% top rate tax, but it does show that the UK in the past has been prepared to be radical for good public services. But there is at least one big difference between UK rates in the past and Scotland today. We have to be more concerned about behaviour change and what might happen with taxpayers at the top end, leaving Scotland or engaging in evasion or avoidance, for example, through incorporation or pay and paying themselves through dividends. And the reality is that we do not know how taxpayers will react to change. Some people will be prepared to pay higher taxes in order to help the community have better education, health, universal benefits, more investment in infrastructure. But we accept there are others who would seek to arrange their tax affairs to, in order to pay less tax. Uh, very quickly, yes. Patrick I'm grateful. As I said in my opening remarks, I'm aware of some work the Scottish Government has done suggesting that there is some evidence that this might happen at the additional rate. Is the member saying there is any evidence at all that it would happen at the higher rate? Well, John Professor Mason. Bell in the, in the Finance Committee in the previous Parliament said that he reckoned that one or two pence difference would not lead to behaviour change. And so my advice or my suggestion would be that we consider uh, small steps. And I noticed that the member said 40 to 43. And I think that's the kind of uh, area we should start with and uh, 41, 42, 43, and then see what happens. And I'd just like to mention Switzerland, uh, where I understand the cantons have different levels of income tax, varying roughly from 17% to 30% with federal tax on top of that. And that suggests that even a small country like Switzerland can cope with quite wide variances in income tax between geographical areas which are not really that far apart. Now, I do accept they have more control over taxes like capital gains tax and gift tax, which uh, Kate Forbes mentioned. Uh, so we have got slightly different challenges. So in conclusion, the government has said it is listening, and I have no reason to think that is not the case. Last year, the Greens obtained a relatively small concession in purely monetary terms, but perhaps it was more significant in Scotland for the first time having a different income tax regime from the rest of the UK. I would love to rewrite the whole system from scratch. That will not be happening this year. 
And hopefully what we can do is have a discussion and negotiate and get a solution which will be acceptable to this Parliament because I believe that is what the Scottish public want. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Julian Martin. Mr Finlay. Thanks, President Officer. Taxation is the price we pay for a civilised society and the collection, collective payment of taxes to fund pu uh, the public provision of services one that Labour is totally committed to. And this is a system that allows us to provide universal health care, universal education, roads and street lighting, fresh water and sanitation. It should allow us to provide good care for the elderly and dignity for those who need their help uh, uh, due to illness or disability. It therefore makes me very angry indeed when we see the debate over taxation reduced to the cynical banality of phrases like tax grab, tax raid or tax bombshell. This plays to the lowest common denominator which seeks to make political capital by promoting self-interest over the common good. The post-war era saw rates of wartime taxation maintained in peacetime to rebuild the country. And in the 70s, we saw genuine and radical redistribution from the rich to the poor. But of course, with every action comes a reaction. And it was then we saw the emerging dogma of neoliberalism rolled out. Tested in Pinochet's Chile, then enthusiastically endorsed and implemented by Thatcher and Reagan, a pernicious dogma that goes against everything I've ever believed in. And if you look at some of the major events over the last few decades, you can see its grubby influence all over it. The global banking crisis, the scandal of the Panama Papers, rising child poverty, the return of diseases like rickets, the austerity driven cuts to services, and even the rise in loneliness and isolation. It's an ideolo ideology that demands a small state, that sees citizens become, become consumers, where services are bought or sold uh, or bid for in a competition, and where privatisation or uh, outsourcing, as it's now been rebranded, turns uh, services into a tradable commodity, where cuts are called now efficiencies or saving. And it says if you don't have a job, it's your own fault, not the fault of a broken system. Someone's rich because of their hard work, not the advantages they have in their life and being poor, well, that's your fault as well. Tax cuts for the rich, benefit cuts for the poor, deregulation, liberalised free markets, uh, the law used against trade unions, and of course, all of this driven and reinforced by in institutions like the IMF, the WTO and the EU. And this brings us to the nub of the taxation issue. Because if you see taxation as a burden and rises in it, not as a method of paying for good things like education, health, social care and safe, a safe and cohesive society, you buy into that neoliberal mindset. So we've heard time and again, the government demanding powers, but it's what you do once you have those powers that is important. So what was the Scottish government's big ideas for Scotland's new tax powers? Changes to redistribute wealth from the many to the few? Not at all. A bill to cut air, uh, air, uh, taxes on air travel to benefit the wealthiest most. On what level is that of progressive and redistributive policy? I'm happy to give way to the Cabinet Secretary and tell us how that is progressive. I don't see him moving. I think that tells you all. Nicola Sturgeon said increasing taxes from 45 to 50p would be daft and reckless. Derek Mackay said it would too, be too easy for Scots to move their wealth around. And we were told by a series of cabinet ministers that Labour's tax plan, plans meant people were paying for Tory austerity twice. I'm never happier than when attacking the Tory party. But let me tell you what is definitely paying for austerity twice. It's when tens of thousands of council, college, police and fire jobs have been cut due to Swinney's cuts that, uh, that in local government were at times even greater than the odious Osborne. Then those workers who have lost their jobs finding that the very services that supported them in their communities have gone too. That's paying twice for Tory and SNP austerity. So I reject outright the neoliberal notion that the, government has, uh, that, that the government has endorsed that paying tax is a bad thing. I think public services are a good thing. I believe an essential, they are the essential civilising services that create a good society. And I would remind the uh, the Cabinet Secretary of a timeless phrase, um, each according to their ability to each according to their need. That is the approach we should have on taxation. Maybe the uh, Cabinet Secretary needs to do a bit of reading.
Thank you. I call Gillian Martin, followed by Tom Mason. Ms. Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I, I wrote initially, I am hopeful that our discussions on tax policy for Scotland will be constructive. And then I scored it out and put was. And I think that was during Murder Fraser's speech. But anyway, I'll carry on regardless. Um, I, I was hoping that everyone taking part in these discussions will just have Scotland's economy, the he health and prosperity of all Scotland's people, and equality and fairness at its heart. Because that's going to be my personal barometer as this discussion uh, goes on. Um, we should all be looking to how we can make our system fair and ensure that whatever changes we make to the current system enhances the Scottish economy and ensures that more money is made available to public services. Because people won't look kindly on any of us who in this chamber stand up demanding that the government give more money to public services on the one hand, but on the other hand demand cuts for the richest in our society. That said, the Scottish public will also not look kindly on any of us who do not address the issue that I'm personally a little bit wary of, and that issue is the potential for tax avoidance. And the fiscal settlement this government's been given is ripe with danger of tax avoidance being enabled. We get the tax mix wrong, and we may find ourselves in a situation where those who are able to pay more find loopholes, pretty glaringly obvious loopholes, and they change their behaviour and status in order that the tax should be raised in Scotland that goes to our public services, ends up going elsewhere, or ends up not raising any significant revenue. As it stands, there are already many individuals legally avoiding paying income tax by incorporating themselves and by paying themselves dividends instead of a salary from which income tax can be taken. Um, and I don't think a, a discussion really here in the moral rights and wrong on that is, is, is helpful because it's, it's not illegal and people are going to do it. One, one solution would be for corporation tax to be devolved as was planned for in the devolved government of Northern Ireland before the current political stalemate. And if that devolved nation can get corporation tax powers, why can't we? Um, I've only got five minutes, so I'm not going to take any interventions. Next is the issue of our labour market strategy and how missing fiscal powers affect that. We do not have significant levers to improve our labour market. We do have significant levers to improve our labour market. So that should mean that we can create more income for public services as a result of that uh, increased economic activity. Increased wages could also mean that our high streets and businesses are stimulated as more people have money to spend, which is great. But that increase in spending without control over VAT means that the extra VAT raised by this economic stimulus doesn't necessarily come back to the Scottish Government who put that labour market strategy in place. So we'll lose out there. And we can't control the rate of that, which might make buying Scottish more attractive to consumers or more attractive to international trade. We also can't do anything about, uh, anything about national insurance uh, as it's still reserved. So we stimulate the labour market, getting more people into work through Scottish Government policies, but we gain nothing for their efforts through that particular tax. I'll give you my favourite example that illustrates some of the points that I've made, and um, one that's very current. So the Scottish Government spends money in increasing free childcare. Jackie Bailey mentioned uh, about what that might cost. But the economic effects of this policy are potentially numerous, and some of them are immediate. Both parents can access the labour market without financial penalty, so they have more family income. They can afford to spend more, increasing consumer spending in Scottish businesses, and one economically inactive parent becomes an income tax payer or is able to increase working hours so the government gets more revenue. And this more than pays for the cost of the free childcare policy. In fact, the revenue generated allows the government to afford new labour market st stimulus measures. Two weeks ago, I spoke to the, the, with the convener of the Labour Market uh, Committee of the Swedish Parliament and we talked about these very arguments and he said to me, your tax situation must be very frustrating, and it is. And I can't, for the life of me, understand why only two parties in this parliament, in the Smith Commission negotiations, ask for con control of national insurance, VAT and corporation tax. Without these, we, we, we make our finance, our labour market and economic strategies a really tricky and frustrating maze, which when changed can have unintended effects. We've got four years without an election, touch wood. Let's do the public a favour and stop trying to grab cheap headlines with a talk of people coming, coming after their pay, their pay packet. Let's talk about making our tax system work. And if at the end of the debate it looks like we really ought to have control over corporation tax, VAT, national insurance, whatever else, let's be united in asking for it for the good of the Scottish economy. And then we can all play with a full deck of cards. Thank you. Thank you.
I call Tom Mason to be followed by Tom Arthur. Mr Mason, please. Mr Mason's microphone is your card in. That's it. Thank you. There you go. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to speak in favour of the amendment proposed by my colleague Murdo Fraser. I do remind, however, colleagues that I'm still an Aberdeen City Councillor. The motion presented by the Labour Party is an interesting one. The issues of personal taxation is one of real concern for those we represent. Unfortunately, there is one clear and simple conclusion that can be drawn from the motion. The Labour Party fundamentally believes in increasing the taxes of some of the lowest earning families in Scotland. They have all too quickly embraced the error that their party and others have made in the past. They see income from taxation as an inexhaustible, inexhaustible supply of free money. They forget or choose to ignore the real impact of their proposals. In our areas, we see hard-working families in difficult circumstances. We see instances where prices rise faster than wages. Scots already have £800 less to spend compared with the rest of the UK. The Labour Party's answer is to look these families, families in the eye and raise their taxes. To take from those that need it the most is an abdication of their responsibilities. Presiding officer, we must also address the implication in the motion that spending on public services is insufficient. We know, thanks to the research published this week by Professor Gallagher of Oxford University, that this is incorrect. We know that Scots benefit from public spending that is around £1,400 higher than per head than in England. We know that even accounting for higher delivery costs in some areas, that spending is not providing a service that meets expectations. Scotland is already the highest tax area in the UK. Instead of further taxes, we should be focused on how to spend what we have in a more competent manner. Our NHS could have been seen an extra billion pounds in funding if Scottish Government had kept pace with overall devolved spending. The SNP bangs, on the, bangs the drum for whatever progressive po policy is popular in any given week. It neglects to use the levers at its disposal to make a difference to the people in their lives. That is why we need real reform in the way we, our public services work, to put delivery ahead of process and to spend in a responsible manner. Providing officers, soon our new fiscal arrangements will see more than 50% of the money we spend raised in Scotland. This requires us to approach public spending and taxation in a more co coordinated and sustainable fashion. Students of economics among us will be mindful of the optimum tax policies. Maybe you've heard of the Laffer Curve, to name an academic example. Shows us that the tangible way in which an effective and dangerously high tax regime can depress an economy and reduce the tax take. The land and business transaction take is a classic example of that system. We've had a total reduction in income. By setting our rates too high, we discourage some of our workplace who conclude that they are better off without working or deciding to go elsewhere. In addition, in addition, businesses will choose to relocate. This is the worst possible result for Scotland. Ports of our notional deficit percentage, all over 8%, being almost four times that of the United Kingdom, should be, this should be extremely concerning to all colleagues. This does not include sustainable economic, does not indicate sustainable economic policy. Whether notional or tangible, the deficit has a very real effect on our ability to deliver public services, so we must not ignore it. With our present fiscal responsibilities, the debt burden is carried by the UK government. Should the debt catch up with us, and I think it probably will, I for one do not want to leave my children and my children's children with an unsustainable debt burden. If we as a parliament focus our energy delivering public services in an efficient and responsible manner, manner and increase jobs and raise wages, we will create opportunities to grow our tax base without taking from those that need it the most. Presiding officer, the Scottish Conservatives and will continue to advocate real reform in how we deliver public services and grow our economy in a way that benefits our constituents. We will continue to stand up for workers and businesses across Scotland. I am pleased to support Murdo Fraser's amendment today. Thank you, presiding officer. Tom Arthur, followed by Ian Gray. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to have the opportunity, and I apologise if my voice goes. I've got a still cut over quite a heavy cold, but I think it's probably appropriate that um, in a conversation about taxis, I sound like death. Um, first, I just want to talk maybe about, <laughs> about the political context. I want to um, welcome uh, the tenor of the offer made by the Cabinet Secretary to engage with all the political parties. Um, colleague Kate Forbes also spoke about being collaborative and I think Gillian Martin made a very important point earlier on about as much as it engendered um, laughter and response, I, I need to get out of our um, entrenched positions um, and work together collaboratively. It is a, as the Cabinet Secretary said, it is a, a parliament of minorities. There will be a need to compromise, there will be a need for responsibility. I've just begun, if you please let me continue to develop my point. Um, there will be a need to compromise, there will be a need for responsibility both with the government and uh, uh, the opposition. And it, equally, it's also important not to prejudice that process. This is just a beginning. And uh, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's reiteration that the discussion paper will be published ahead of the budget. Um, but I think what I'd like just really to sort of set out is I think we have to take um, cognizance of the economic context that we're operating within. We've seen inflation, CPI inflation, um, in the UK up to 2.9%, a joint uh, highest in the last five years. That's ahead of wage growth. Um, and I think that's important because when we're talking about behavioural impacts, it's not about just tax relocation, potentially. It's about consumer spending and the knock-on effect that, that has too. Um, I also just want to, there's a point I want to pick up, but actually Bill Bowman, who's not in his place, uh, Sort of raised it, and it was the issue of a uh, constitutional uncertainty. I, and for once, um, I'm going to agree with him because I think anyone who's read, um, for example, uh, today the uh, agent summary of a decision maker panel from the Bank of England on the uh, growth of a number of businesses where uh, the issue of Brexit is amongst the top two concerns, the, um, the FSB report on uh, small business confidence falling, and particularly a Fraser um, of Allardyce Institute. Um, saying that the immediate concern is um, that the um, exit negotiations themselves go awry and the greatest cloud on the immediate horizon remains the Brexit negotiations. And this is something actually that lands squarely at the feet of the Conservative Party. And this makes it a very challenging environment to talk about tax because of the economic violence and the uncertainty that we're facing. And this is something obviously that's been compounded with the uh, Foreign Secretary's approach, um, who is apparently um, threatening to resign, though he says, um, and I quote, that the cabinet is a nest of singing birds. Well, he seems to be the cuckoo in the nest. Um, and I think that if we take cognizance of that, then we can move forward in a way that's considered um, and consider proposals based upon some fundamental principles. And I think a few points that have been made is the need to consider um, tax and spending not um, okay, very James Kelly. Sorry, thank Tom Arthur for taking the intervention. In terms of fundamental principles, do you accept the principle of increasing income tax in order to support greater investment in public services? Tom Arthur. I'll come to that. I'll actually, I'll address the Labour Amendment specifically because it says that income tax should be increased to allow greater investment in public services. That amendment in itself begs the question. Uh, it does, because it asks whether or not there's... I can appreciate prima facie it would seem that simply putting up income taxes is going to lead to greater revenue, but that is not the case. We know that with the additional rate. And again, any implications of ad adjusting any of the other rates can be reflected upon consumer spending. Now, I am not prejudicing that process, but it has to be a rational cool, level-headed conversation. It has to be detached from ideology and it has to be considered in the context of public spending. Could so we stop is, the, the shouting from the sidelines, please? Mr. So I, think it's, I think it's a... I think it's, it's a principle we have to work at. I can appreciate where the Labour Party is at. It's, it's an easy ask from opposition. Let's put all the, the bands of tax up. But there is consequences to that. There is behavioural consequences and, in the case of additional rate taxpayers, potential behavioural impacts. I'm sorry, I'm in my last 20 seconds and there's no time in hand. There is obviously the dangers of taxpayers relocating. Now, that is, and as my colleagues have made, not having power over dividends, not having power over corporation tax, this could le lead to a net loss in revenue. There is much more I'd like to be able to discuss, but unfortunately, presiding officer, time is against me. 
have Ian Gray, followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, President Officer. Three years ago, uh, I gave 10 weeks of my life to the metaphorically smoke-filled room that was the Smith Commission, and we agreed significant tax powers for this Parliament. Three years on, uh, Patrick Harvey uh, is right. It is past time that we had a government with the gumption to use those powers for the benefit of this country, and that we do not is self-evidently true. The SNP have voted down amendments to use the tax powers of the Parliament to end austerity in the last two budgets, and they have voted against increasing tax on those who earn the most, no fewer than eight times since 2015. And this they've made common cause with and depended on the support of the Tories, of course. And when it comes to tax, we, we know what the Tories stand for. They will always prioritise tax cuts for the better off over investment and services for the betterment of all. In contrast, the SNP love to talk tough on UK taxes, whether it's in noises off from the green benches of Westminster, in this chamber today in the Cabinet Secretary's opening remarks, or indeed uh, in their motion uh, in the Business Bulletin. But when it comes to actually doing something progressive with Scottish taxation, there they are, rabbits in the headlights of a hard decision. Look at their motion. Derek Mackay, in their motion, boldly demands that we all supply him with our tax plans so he can staple them together into a discussion document. <laughs> what a weapon he is forging against inequity and inequality. What a warrior for justice he will be with his consultation on a constructive discussion paper for a framework for tax in a devolved Scotland. The truth is, we know everybody's policy on tax here, except his. Mr Rowley set ours out in detail, but the only tax policy Mr Mackay has is to cut the air passenger duty and hand two, £200 million pounds over exactly to airlines right. and to airport operators. Exactly right. The truth is, Mr Mackay, there is no consensus here on tax. You can support the Tories on tax cuts and austerity, or you can support the rest of us on progressive taxation. The question is, whose side are you on? But of course, oh, he's, he's not really looking for consensus, is he? He's looking for a cop-out. He's not really seeking common ground on which to stand, but rather a place to hide. And that timidity, inaction and downright hypocrisy on tax has had consequences. Under the protection of this SNP government, the income of Scots earning over £150,000 has soared by 68%. And the number of Scottish taxpayers in that category has almost doubled, while 40,000 more Scottish children found themselves living in poverty last year alone. Or, Look at the public service this government claims as its priority, education. They have spent... Surely. Derek Mackay. Uh, as Ian Gray has mentioned, uh, he was involved in the talks in terms of new powers coming to Scotland. What weighting should we attach uh, the block grant adjustment when arriving at our final tax position, can I ask Mr Gray? Ian Gray. And yet again, another place to hide from the hard decisions of government. All too complicated for the rest of us to understand. Mr Mackay, this is a debate about the principle. And the principle is, are you prepared to use progressive taxation to fund public services or, or are you not? And it's clear that you're not. Because if we look at our schools, we spend £491 less per head per pupil in real terms than in 2007. Ten years ago, our teachers were amongst the best paid in the developed world. Now they are paid less and worked harder than their counterparts almost anywhere else. When ministers consulted on school reforms, parents, teachers, educationalists, councillors, SNP councils queued up to say the same thing. The problem our schools have is a lack of capacity. The problem is the cuts. Our colleges told the audit committee last week their finances are not sustainable. And in universities too, Scottish government funding for teaching has been cut by 7.5% since 2014. And of course, 
Ministers protest they're spending millions on the pupil equity fund to cut the attainment gap. But they have slashed millions more from the core council budgets which support our schools. That's why our proposal for Fair Start funding was directly linked to that 50p tax rate, asking the richest to pay a little more to invest in helping those who need it most. Real additional investment, not robbing Peter to pay Paul and then looking for a pack in the to back. Close, please. And this is tax and invest, because the only way to face the challenges this country faces is to invest in the skills and education of our next generation. And the only way to you do that close, is please. to have the guts to use those tax powers and use them now. I call Jordan McAlpin to be followed by Alison Harris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Alec Rowley knows that I respect him as a, a politician of integrity and no friend of the Tories. But he's letting the Tories off the hook if he tries to pin this Parliament down to plugging the black hole of austerity in advance of the budget in November. Despite the changes made in the Scotland Bill, a substantial portion of Scotland income comes back to us in the shape of a block grant. And progressive parties in this chamber should all be working as hard as we can to put pressure on the Chancellor to abandon austerity and give us the settlement we require in that budget to fund our public services, just as we work together. Excuse me, Ms McAlpin. Ms Lamont, could you please stop shouting from my left-hand side? It's distracting for the speaker, for me and for those who are trying to listen. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we worked together on the fiscal framework where the Tories tried to slash Scotland's budget by £6 billion. So I hope we can work together to put pressure on them uh, in the forthcoming budget in November. Um, as has already been said, the Scottish Government's figures show a real term cut of 9.2% between 10, 2010 and 2020 uh, under the Tories. And looking forward, the Fraser of Allender Institute last year predicted a cut of 1.6 billion between now and 2021, a real terms cut of 6%. And that's why we're having this debate today and the reason why the First Minister has invited all parties to contribute their ideas to this discussion paper on tax. And there have been a number of constructive uh, contributions today, uh, particularly by uh, Patrick Harvey, um, who, put, who, who put forward um, uh, a number of uh, elements of the Green Party's manifesto. Um, of course, these ideas like these will need to be modelled uh, so that we can see how much revenue they are likely to ra uh, uh, raise and the effect on behaviour. Uh, as this discussion pans out, uh, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that these decisions have, and this discussion has been forced on us. Uh, indeed, there's a significant body of opinion, no thank you, uh, which believes that this was always the Tories' intention uh, to cut this Parliament's budget in order to force us uh, into raising income tax, uh, which they will then condemn uh, a trap, in other words, uh, back in 2015. Uh, David Cameron, uh, the Prime Minister at the time, was completely transparent about his intentions when he spoke to the House of Commons about the income tax powers in the Scotland Bill. Uh, he said, uh, and I quote, I, uh, I want the SNP here and in Holyrood to start making decisions. Which taxes are you going to raise and what are you going to do with benefits? So though the Tories here repeatedly bleat against proposed tax rises, uh, one can't help but suspect that it's all part of the grand design to undermine confidence in this parliament, indeed, in devolution itself, no thank you, um, to cut Holyrood's budget. Um, because that's what happens when you limit uh, the amount of taxes uh, raised uh, to a very small uh, number of taxes, uh, which of which income tax is the most substantial. It, it means that the, the finance secretary has, uh, has very little power uh, to manoeuvre. And uh, I would remind members of some of the contributions uh, in committee of eminent economists, such as Andrew Hughes, no thank you, Andrew Hughes Hallett, uh, who said that you really need a basket of taxes uh, in order to be able to uh, manage the economy uh, with maximum efficiency, um, which is something that uh, Professor Gallagher, uh, who was quoted earlier and who was the secretary to the Kalman Commission, as I recall, uh, set, his, set his, um, himself against and was always very much opposed to. Um, make no mistake, presiding officer, uh, what we're doing here is looking at preserving 
uh, better public services in Scotland and the better outcomes that, that we have experienced in Scotland because we've made different choices here. Uh, NHS spending in Scotland is higher per head than England, uh, 1470 compared to 1266. Uh, staffing in the NHS in Scotland under the SNP, we have 12,000 more staff and again more per head, 25.9 per thousand population in Scotland compared to 19 per thousand population in England. And of course, in England, students face tuition fees of 9,000 plus a year, and the educational maintenance allowance for low-income pupils in England has been abolished, whereas in Scotland, it has been retained and expanded. In police, uh, England has seen 19,000 police officers cut, and in Scotland, we have, of course, uh, appointed 1,000 more officers. I could go on and talk about the um, no compulsory redundancy policy, which uh, this SNP government put in place at an early stage and of course the £400 million was spent mitigating uh, welfare cuts and introducing aspects of the social wage like free prescriptions. That's why Scotland is a country worth living in and a Scotland that puts fairness first. If we want to preserve these advances we need to have this debate close, and we please. need to model different tax ideas to see how much revenue they raise when behaviour is taken into account. Uh, in conclusion, the Tories are saying today that they want us Quick to mimic conclusion. their Westminster counterparts on both tax and cuts, but we, do, we won't be doing that and that's why I welcome the discussion. The last of the open debate speeches is Alison Harris. Deputy Presiding Officer. The Labour Party, by coming to the Chamber today and telling us that they want to increase the tax burden on two and a half million hard-working Scots and their families, have clearly set out their stall. A return to high tax and high spending that has clearly been rejected by the Scottish voters. From John Swinney's 1999 proposal to increase income tax by one pence, which voters roundly rejected, to Labour promising tax rises in their 2016 Scottish Manifesto, proposals which contribute to their worst Holyrood result. However, by 2016, even Mr Swinney was highlighting what we on this side of the chamber knew already. Referring to the Labour proposal, he said, this is a tax change that would have a detrimental effect on the incomes of low income households. Whilst these are words from the deputy, I'm sorry, I'm going to make some progress. Whilst these are words from the deputy first minister, which, which, with which we can wholeheartedly agree, we are concerned that in this chamber, only a few short weeks ago, the First Minister refused to affirm her party's manifesto commitment to freezing the basic rate of tax. It seems that we may well be seeing the start of yet another competition amongst other parties in this chamber to take more and more tax from the pockets of Scottish workers. I am proud that this is a race that the Scottish Conservatives will not be entering. Instead, we shall continue to stand on the side of Scottish families and Scottish business. The SNP and the Greens have already made Scotland the highest tax part of the UK and on the highest tax part. Right, OK. Derek Mackay. So does the member, Alison Harris, say that uh, Fraser of Allender Institute got it wrong when the, on the 10th of April 2017 they confirmed that Scotland wasn't the highest tax part of the UK if you look at all taxes in the round? Alison Harris. Today we're actually talking about income tax and where income tax is concerned we actually are the higher part, the highest tax part of the UK. So the SNP and the Greens have already, we, are, we actually are. The SNP and the Greens have already made Scotland the highest tax part of the UK and for any further attempt to make Scots pay more than people in the rest of the country is still as unpopular as ever. The concern over higher taxes goes well beyond individuals. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce have said that... Mr Arthur, would, would you stop muttering from your seat, please? Carry on, Ms Harris. Thank you. The concern over higher taxes goes well beyond individuals. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce have said that higher taxes north of the border would set a dangerous precedent and that growing our economy rather than increasing taxes will provide the most sustainable route towards boosting tax revenues and thus public spending. Less money in people's pockets clearly will come at a price in terms of jobs and growth. The Institutes of Directors has said that raising income tax would send the wrong message. And David Longsdale, director of the Scottish Retail Consortium, has said that the Scottish Government should keep income tax rates down, boosting customer confidence and keeping consumer spending buoyant to support the economy as well as government spending. 
Deputy Presiding Officer, as well as supporting the need for working families to keep more of their own money, I wish to turn now to say more about Scotland's small business sector. Almost 70% of the country's 350,000 private sector businesses are unincorporated and paying personal taxes. Many of these people work long and hard to develop their businesses. Many of these small enterprises are in sectors ranging from agriculture to tourism and they're struggling. The last thing small business wants to see is the added burden of an increase in personal taxes. What a disincentive to work the long hours to provide both the service and to create the wealth that generates further employment. One of my constituents put it, I can understand the need to tax things that are bad for you, such as alcohol and cigarettes, but why do some politicians want to constantly increase the tax on work? In the small business survey carried out on behalf of the Scottish Government earlier this year, it is interesting that the top three obstacles given by the SMEs to the success of a business were competition in the market, red tape and regulations, and then taxation. Growing the economy is key to our economic success and keeping taxes low is a major component in achieving growth. I am delighted that with this amendment, no, I have no time now, I'm sorry. There's I no am time. delighted that with this amendment, the Scottish Conservatives are yet again signalling that we are on the side of those who would be hit by the tax proposals put forward by other parties. The Scottish Conservatives are with those struggling to grow a business. We will never cease sending out the message that increased taxes disincentivises work and therefore growth. And this can be seen with the LBTT. This is an example which showed us that increased taxes can actually reduce anticipated tax take. I am delighted to support the Conservative amendment this afternoon. We now move on to the closing speeches. Disappointing to note that not everyone who contributed is back in their seats. And I call on Willie Rennie for up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, I was intrigued by what Derek Mackay said. Um, it wasn't his opening speech, which was OK. It was the intervention to Ian Gray, where he talked about the block grant adjustment and whether our tax proposal should reflect the consequences of the block grant adjustment. So he's clearly reached some kind of conclusion on some kind of flexible... <laughs> Well, if it, comes to, if it comes to conspiracies, all we need to listen to is Joan McAlpine, who believes that all the unionist parties have set up this parliament so we can do down Scotland. That's exactly why we've done it. So I won't take anything about conspiracy theories. But it was interesting, and this is a very serious point, because I, I think he should elaborate in, in his summing up, because he's obviously reached some kind of conclusion. Well, I'll take an intervention if you can elaborate now. That would be Derek fantastic. Okay. I suppose to assist Willie Rennie and other members of the Chamber, the fiscal framework has a block grant adjustment which does actually relate to how much tax we actually accrue to Scotland is relative to the tax decisions in the United Kingdom. So I happen to think it's important that members understand that when they set out their tax positions. Willie Rennie. Well, that's, that's great because that's more than we got in Derek Mackay's opening remarks. This was a generality about, about partnership. So let's... I think it should be, it's important for Derek Mackay to try and set out some of the substance on this because he's obviously got the support of all his officials behind him to help him work his way through the fiscal framework. So let's see what kind of conclusions he has obviously reached already or otherwise he wouldn't have made that intervention to Ian Gray. So I'm intrigued by that, just that little remark at one point. And the fact that Derek Mackay is protesting so much probably proves the point that I have actually hit on the mark. Um, this is actually a healthy debate. Um, we've often, for many, many years in this parliament, we debated how to spend the extra money or the less money that we had from Westminster. But now we've got the responsibility to also consider the impact on taxpayers. And I think that's made this a much more rounded parliament, one that's considering the impact on, on people's spending as well as government spending too. So I think it's actually improved the nature of the debate uh, in this chamber. Although I don't think it was assisted by Thomas Mason, who talked about the level of debt, because we're not talking about increasing borrowing here. We're talking about potentially increasing taxation, living within our means, but actually increasing taxation in order to be able to spend on public services. I didn't quite understand why he was bringing that remark into it. And neither did I really appreciate the remarks from Bill Bowman. I thought Bill Bowman describing tax as pickpocketing. I don't regard 
saving people's lives in hospitals as pickpocketing. I don't regard educating children in our schools as pickpocketing. I actually think taxation can be a force for good to change people's lives and to describe it in that emotive way I do not think helps the debate in this chamber. And he also described us as part of the left-wing consensus. I don't remember him <laughs> describing us as that when we were in this coalition with him before. But let's forget uh, that fact too. <laughs> um, I, was, uh, I was interested in John Mason's remarks. I thought it was a good contribution about more radical proposals. I'd quite like to see exactly what he means in terms of the, the detail of that. I think Tom Arthur talked about um, both sides of the balance sheet being considered, which is a point I've just referred to as well. Um, Ian Gray, I thought, made a great contribution, talking about the, the time that he spent in the Smith Commission, because since 2007, the SNP government were able, to some degree, to complain about um, other decisions by UK governments and the impact on public spending in Scotland, with the inability to have the flexibility to do something else. But Smith gave that flexibility. It's given that flexibility since 2015-16. So we've got the ability to do things differently. And what's disappointing is that the first, not just now, the first decision that we made in this panel was to do exactly the same as we'd done before, irrespective of the powers that we've now got. And I think that is regrettable, but to be on the upside, I think it's positive that Derek Mackay is now embracing the potential, the potential only, for something different um, for Scotland. So I think it's an opportunity now to look forward. Um, Therefore, I was disappointed that Kate Forbes and Gillian Martin did hark back to that old debate that I thought we had put behind us for a little while at least about the argument about what powers we should have in this place rather than using the powers that we've actually got just now. And in the particular argument around about corporation tax was interesting because both took opposing positions on that, one saying we could never cut it and the other one saying we possibly could. And both seem to be in contradiction to Alex Salmon, who just want to slash it right down to Irish levels. So we have a multitude of different positions on that. But the interesting point, not just now, the interesting point was on the personal allowance. That Kate Forbes in particular wanted the personal allowance to come to Scotland. Now, we've got the ability here to create a zero band, to raise the personal allowance higher than the threshold that it is just now. So the only purpose for wanting control of the personal allowance would be to lower it. To take it down, to ta no, to, I'm, I'm finishing There's no point. time for to intervention. take it down to a lower level, to cut, to actually to increase tax, to increase tax on the lowest then or something that I worked really hard to change, to take people out of tax altogether. So I thought it was astonishing, astonishing that that was one of the proposals that they would want to bring back to this parliament because it, it could only mean higher taxes for the poor. And one, one final point. There is a rumour going yes. around that the government Please. is going to abstain on the Labour motion today. They're going to abstain. That would be... You must close, I, please, Mr to, Rennie. Well, we need some clarity on exactly what the government is proposing uh, to do today. Because what they should do is embrace, embrace the opportunity to Could do something different Could we stop the editor interventions, in please? that parliament? Thank you very much. And I call Patrick Harvey. Uh, up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. We uh, have managed to avoid reaching the level of a Stairheed Rami. We haven't quite been that bad. Uh, but I, I suspect that over the, the coming months, if the government is remotely serious about having a discussion about shifting its own position, uh, I suspect it will be those who positively set out a constructive case for change rather than just those uh, who insult their opponent's track record who might see uh, some progress made. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was pleased that, that Willie Rennie, who I would never flatter by calling part of the left-wing consensus, I was pleased that he was so grateful for the reminder of green policy uh, in my opening position. And I'm sure that anyone who heard a note of sarcasm uh, in his voice must have been mistaken, given that he went on to criticise the lack of detail from other parties. But given that he's uh, not a fan of interventions, I've still not had the opportunity to find out from the Liberal Democrats if they are open to the idea uh, of splitting the basic rate so that we don't have to increase taxes 
on lower than average earners. And the, the idea of a zero rate simply will be one more way of spreading that tax cut to everybody right up to the additional rate threshold. That's not a socially just way of reducing the tax burden. And I'm surprised as well a little bit about the Conservatives because it seems to me that there ought to be some kind of point of common ground from the Conservatives looking at the Green proposals on taxation because they are the only proposals that have been advanced so far that would cut the tax bill for the majority of households in Scotland. Taking our income tax, our local council tax and our NDR proposals in the round, we would be cutting the tax burden not on the wealthiest, as the UK government have, but on the lowest income part of our society, and the majority of households would be paying less tax. The, the Conservative position at the moment seems to be based on magical thinking. Cut every tax going, cut ADT, cut income tax, cut taxes on business, and still keep spending more across the board. If there's anybody who believes in the magic money tree, it's the Conservative Party. And the, uh, Murdo Fraser, uh, I, I think, came to, toward the end of his speech uh, saying that we're in, essentially in the same position as we were in 2007. Well, whatever point he was trying to make about the public finances, People are not in the same position that they were in in 2007. A huge number of people have seen the real terms, value of their wages, go down and down and down in the public sector and the private sector. And the impact of taxation on them is deeply regressive. If we look at the combination of income tax and indirect taxation, it's the poorest fifth of our population who are paying the highest tax burden, the highest share of their income in overall taxation at 38%, higher than any other section of the population. So we have a, a deeply regressive approach to tax at the moment. There is one point of common ground that I had with the Conservatives in that there isn't yet clarity from the SNP on their position. And I, I, I agree with that, that point. I don't expect a fully developed proposition from the SNP at this point in what is supposed to be uh, an open discussion. Uh, after all, I do want opposition parties to have the chance to push them beyond their comfort zone uh, uh, in the right direction. Digging heels in is not the right way to start. But I do think the SNP should have begun this discussion by setting out some clear principles. One, that increased demands on public services require increased overall revenue. And two, that this must be done in a way that reduces inequality in our society. And if we, if we began the conversation with agreement, at least across most of the political parties, on those key principles, then I think we would have a much stronger basis for moving forward. And as far as the Greens are concerned, this must mean restoring the lost value in public sector pay. And I note that Unison's view, published last week, uh, is that a 5% increase uh, for inflation is justified. So a, above inflation increase for public sector workers to begin to restore some of the lost real terms value. If we had these two key principles at the start of this conversation, and if the SNP even today is able to agree to those two principles, uh, I would welcome it. Uh, it, would, it would never lead us, for example, to, to Gillian Martin's demands for the freedom to cut corporation tax even more deeply than the UK has done at a time when many corporates are still using tax havens or other tax dodges. Yes, indeed. Gillian Martin. Mr. Mr. Harvey, with all due respect, I never, ever said anything about what I would cut and what I wouldn't cut. Everyone upset. What I was merely saying is that if we had the powers for all these tax, we would be able to have a full deck of cards with which to play. Patrick Harvey. The SNP's position in the past has been to devolve corporation tax in order to cut it, and that absolutely needs to be rejected. I, I, would, agree, I would agree to this extent with, with Gillian Martin and with Kate Forbes that it would lead us to a discussion about the wider approach to taxation, not just on income tax. Uh, but Kate Forbes framed that entirely as a complaint about the constraints that exist. What we need to do is recognise that we have always, since 1999, had unfettered power to levy taxes for local services. Local taxation has been constrained only by the political paralysis in this parliament, the unwillingness to move, to reform and to replace both council tax and non-domestic rates with something fairer and more progressive. Uh, we will oppose 
uh, the uh, government's amendment, just as we will continue to oppose their regressive position on ADT, uh, and in the long run, we'll continue to argue for a shift for, for taxation away from income and toward the wealth inequalities that are even more grotesque in our society than income inequality. I call Dean Lockhart. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. It's been an interesting and at times even entertaining debate this afternoon. On this side of the chamber, we've been watching the other parties clambering over each other to declare their high-tax left-wing credentials. From Labour, we've heard from the Corbynites. They want to increase tax for everyone. And from the SNP, we've heard from the Corbyn lights. We all know they want to increase tax, but they won't come off the fence and admit it. And that's what's been remarkable about this debate. Every party except the government has explained their income tax policy. Alex Rowley made it clear Labour wants to increase income tax for everyone earning over £11,500. That's a tax increase for over 2.5 million people in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And to raise the top rate to 50 pence. For the Greens and Liberals, Patrick Harvey and Willie Rennie, I will later, Patrick Harvey and Willie Rennie confirmed that they're also part of the high tax bonanza. As for the SNP, instead of debating its income tax policy in the chamber, they, Denny Mackay tells us they want to have an informed discussion. So there we have it, just two weeks after the SNP published its programme for government promising a bold and ambitious vision for a modern, dynamic economy, we discover from Derek Mackay that this government does not in fact have an income tax policy. We really shouldn't be surprised. The SNP has shown this level of confusion before on tax. After all, it's the party who wants to cut air departure tax because it will boost the economy and which has repeatedly warned against the increasing the top rate of tax because in the words of the First Minister, as Bill Bowman highlighted, it would be reckless, it would be daft to do so. But at the same time, this is also the party that has increased land and buildings transaction tax, causing a loss in revenues of over £800 million. And the same party that two weeks ago, in the programme for government, called for the innovators of the world to come to Scotland only now to tell them that they will be taxed more in Scotland than elsewhere in the UK. Presenting officer, our amendment to the Labour motion today reflects the fiscal reality that higher income tax in Scotland will not deliver more funding and it will not deliver more investment for public services. I will later. Let me just explain the reasons why higher tax will not result in higher uh, tax revenues. Under the fiscal framework agreed by the SNP, the level of public spending available in Scotland going forward will be directly linked to the performance of the Scottish economy relative to the UK economy. And we found out today from the Fraser of Allender that there is forecast, the underperformance of the Scottish economy is forecast to underperform the rest of the UK for years to come. The same report also highlights that consumer confidence in Scotland remains negative and lower, and lower, just this point, and lower than the rest of the UK and the earnings and disposable income in Scotland continue to fall, leading to negative multi multiplier effects in the economy. High tax or higher tax will only make this situation worse. Mr McKay. Uh, can I say it's up to the member whether or not they take an intervention and when they take an intervention? Derek McKay. Uh, my apologies, presiding officer, and I appreciate Dean Lockhart taking the intervention. Can I ask Dean Lockhart if he agrees with the Scotland office that the UK government is responsible for the Scottish economy? Dean Lockhart. Uh, there's a long answer to that. The UK economy is responsible for monetary policy with record low interest rates and record low mortgage rates under the UK uh, uh, government. However, the Scottish government is responsible for enterprise policy and growing that part of the economy. And for the 10 years under the SNP, the Scottish economy has underperformed the rest of the UK with the same parameters. So, Deputy President, instead of listening to the failed left-wing consensus, uh, as Alison Harris said, and Willie Rennie uh, may, might be part of that, we should listen to the experts. For example, the Scottish Chambers of Commerce has made it clear growing the Scottish economy, not squeezing the last drops out of workers, will generate more tax revenues. Another negative consequence of increasing tax will be behavioural change that we have heard in other debates. It would only take 1,000 top-rate taxpayers to transfer their tax base out of Scotland for there to be a decline in overall tax revenues. This was recognised by Kezia Dugdale when she said that raising the top rate of tax to 50% could, in her words, raise zero because of the mechanisms by which people can avoid paying tax. These concerns were raised in the Economy Committee yesterday when we heard that uh, taxpayers' additional rate as well as high, higher rate 
could incorporate and take their income streams out of the ta Scottish tax system altogether, something that a higher rate compared to the rest I don't have time, something that a higher rate in Scotland would encourage. So, presenting officer, as a number of members have said, tax policy doesn't operate in isolation. We agree. It's therefore incumbent on all parties to recognise the reality that we are in tax competition with the rest of the UK as well as the rest of the world. And for these reasons, our amendment to the motion today makes our policy position clear. There is no case for raising income tax rates in Scotland above those payable elsewhere in the UK and that to provide reassurance to the lowest paid, a rise in the basic rate of income tax should be immediately ruled out. On this basis, we look forward to hearing the Finance Secretary in his closing remarks whether or not he is willing to confirm the pledge made in the SNP Holyrood Manifesto last year when it said they would freeze the basic rate of income tax throughout the next Parliament to protect those on low and middle incomes. The hard working people of Scotland deserve an answer. Thank you. I call Derek Mackay. Absolutely no more than seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. OK, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I can hear Joanne Lamont disappointed that it's only seven minutes that you'll get to hear from me for. But can I say, uh, first of all, Presiding Officer, that over the course of last year's uh, budget, where this government approved over £900 million pounds of ex extra expenditure on Scotland's public services, there was a cry from the other political parties to, to listen to them on tax, to listen closely to their position on tax. And now there's an outcry, a united outcry from some of the opposition parties that I'm listening to them on tax. How dare the Scottish Government enter into a well-informed debate about tax in this country? But Willie Rennie actually asked, I think, very important questions about the context of that debate and uh, that discussion paper. And the reason, if I can finish this point, and, and the reason I think it's important to add confidence to the discussion paper is so that every political party can appreciate what I'm trying to do is fairly model their propositions. And incidentally, it will be the chief economist. So it's up to you how much you trust the chief economic uh, advisor of Scotland to do those calculations to then inform that paper and that debate, which will present all policies fairly and equally. And I think that that will be a very helpful intervention because I heard one member in the chamber say, why are you bothering with all this modelling of propositions? Because it's actually quite important if you're about to make a tax proposition that you know in fairness what it means in terms of the revenue that it would raise and also what impact it may have on our society. So it should be an evidence-based paper, understanding the propositions put by the political parties uh, in a fair way. I had committed to take an intervention from Joanne Lamont. Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary confirm in saying that he's now willing to enter into a fair debate on taxation, that the debate before that was not fair, that it concluded with the idea that taxation was taking money from the poorest, when in fact we know that progressive taxation will benefit through public spending, creation of jobs, social and economic opportunity. Will you now apologise for the way in which you characterised taxation policy before and enter a serious debate about the need for progressive taxation? Derek Mackay. But you see, the problem for the Labour Party is that last year we had a serious debate on how to use our powers, how to use them responsibly, how to invest in our public services and how to give um, stability uh, to our uh, economy. And, you know, tax powers are not a toy set you play with. You use them in such a way as to raise the revenue to spend on our public services, but also in a way that's concurrent with the kind of Scotland that we seek and can support business growth eh, as well. And I made the point in last year's budget that we committed to and are delivering over £900 million worth of extra investment in this country in the teeth of opposition from the Labour Party and the Tory Party eh, as it happens. Now, I listened carefully to what the Labour Party said, and I would like to make more progress. And I listened very carefully to what the Labour Party said in outlining their tax position, which, yes, did include uh, raising the basic rate, completely unaware of the people that that would reach. But I appreciate that the Labour Party has put forward the position. We've been in office uh, for 10 years. I think Labour, including their interim Excuse leaders... Excuse me, on Cabinet the... Secretary, can we have a bit of parliamentary respect, please, from those who are continuing to shout from their seats? 
Cabinet Secretary. So I respect the position of the Labour Party, but I am left wondering which Labour leader is it I have to go to to get the tax policies to model to be able to inform this uh, debate. Now, I've tried to stress the importance of the block grant adjustment because it actually does matter the relationship between tax in the UK and tax in Scotland as well to ensure that we actually raise the revenue that's required. The Lib Dems have set out a position. It may well be viewed as a tax and spend commitment. It may well be viewed as ring fencing for, for education. Uh, but I can assure the Lib Dems that if they engage, uh, engage positively, then it will at least be a well-informed debate in which we will have choices to make, and that is absolutely constructive. The position, no thank you, the position from the Conservatives, of course, I wanted to intervene to expand upon to see, is it still the position of the Conservatives to reduce tax for land and building transaction tax, higher value homes? Is it still the position to reduce it for council tax? Is it still the position to reduce it for large business supplement as well? Sticking to the theme from the Tories that they will only protect the richest in society, which is exactly why I want the Tories' proposition to fairly model what that actually means and have a fair debate. In terms, it, not, not right now, I've got very little time left, because a number of members have fairly asked about the position of the government. But I said in my opening remarks, if the SNP simply produces, simply produces our manifesto commitment and put it to the chamber, we will not win. Because this is a parliament of minorities, and that is exactly the reason we should engage in a well-informed, evidence-based debate on what powers we have and how they could be used in a reasonable and responsible way. I give way to Patrick Harvey. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful. The, the Cabinet Secretary earlier made an important point about the modelling he expects to be done by his officials of the proposals that come from other parties. Can he confirm that that modelling will not only look at the revenue to be raised, but will also look at the impact on income inequality in our society and test each party's proposition, including his own proposition, against that as a principal objective? Derek Mackay, final minute. Yes, I do believe that's a fair contribution to a well-informed debate as to how we should use our tax powers. And I say again, if we want to have a a well-informed debate. We have to understand the basics, and that's why I am so surprised that many members in the chamber didn't appreciate the importance of the block grant adjustment, doesn't appreciate the importance of where wealth is in this country, and why other uh, Mr. Uh, powers last actually minute. matter in that regard. Now, I want to return to something that Alec Rowley actually said, which it was this. He accepted that this could be a well-informed, rational debate, and we should engage in it in that spirit. Of course, many of the colleagues sitting by behind him said, why, why the need for tackling Westminster? I need to return to this point, that we still do have an opportunity before the UK government and the UK Chancellor sets his budget to oppose the dodgy DUPO, to oppose austerity, to have a proper approach on public sector pay. And we must not give up on that battle as we approach our own budget and our own tax decisions. But I'll continue to take decisions responsibly and reasonably, and I offer the, the other parties that opportunity to engage in this so we can have a debate on income tax that we can be proud of. I call James Kelly up to decision time, please, Mr Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to close this afternoon's debate, which has been a very important debate because it's allowed the parties to set out the parameters of their tax policies ahead of the publication of the draft budget, which comes later in the year. And I think that's important because what we raise in taxes, what we set the budget at, has a direct impact on the services that we provide to our communities and our ability to grow Scotland's economy. And I think it's been a very good debate in the sense that we've, we've heard from most of the parties what their position is. The Tories have set out a position of no income tax rises. Willie Rennie's advocated a long-held position of, of using a penny income tax to support investment in education. Patrick Harvey's laid out uh, using different rates to raise uh, taxes. What's been disappointing in that is that the government essentially have sat on the fence in terms of what their position is. Because what the Labour Party are trying to do in this debate is set a situation where we, we agree that we will raise income tax in order to produce greater investment in public services. 
and the, the SNP have backed out from answering that question today. And it's an important question when you look at the landscape of public services in Scotland. Take the NHS, for example. 300 operations cancelled in July. I had a constituent come to me last week that it's going to take 21 months from, a, from first diagnosed to when he will be able to get a hip replacement. That is totally unacceptable. In education, we heard Alec Rowley outline the position of uh, 4,000 less teachers. And that has a direct impact, as we saw last week when uh, the head teacher of Trinity Academy wrote out asking for volunteers to fill up the gaps uh, in the teaching resource in that school. And that's not the first time that that's happened. And then you look at the position in councils. 7,000 jobs lost in 2015-16 alone as this SNP government piles on the public spending cuts towards Scotland communities. It's just not on, uh, presiding officer. And I think there's a real issue about uh, the fairness aspect of the, the, the taxation policies being pursued uh, by the SNP government. Uh, as Ian Gray pointed out, millionaires are only paying £2 more uh, in tax uh, per week. And as, as Neil Finlay pointed out, the proposed reduction in ADT uh, will result in not only in taking £190 million pounds out of the Scottish budget, but as the think tank fellow travellers pointed out, the, the, those who will benefit will be the top 10% of taxpayers, while the bottom 10% of taxpayers suffer a disadvantage. So there's a lack of fairness uh, around those taxation policies uh, being produced and being looked at uh, by, by the SNP. Yeah, I'll take an interview. June McAlpine. June McAlpine, please. Explain to me why Labour councils have not taken the opportunity that they have to raise council tax to meet some of the challenges he describes. James Kelly. Coun councils all across Scotland have faced £170 million cumulative cuts because of the votes of the SNP benches here today. And the reality is, the reality is that Derek Mackay tells us that he wants a debate about taxation. He's got an army full of civil servants and yet he's asking the other political parties to come up with their suggestions on taxation. It comes down to give your answers on a postcard, please, to Derek Mackay, care of St Andrew's House. <laughs> and one of the disappointing aspects of that is when, when Derek Mackay comes to publish the modelling, it comes to look at the modelling that he's been discussing this afternoon. The last, one of the last times the Scottish Government uh, produced, had modelling on local income tax, they went to court to stop the publication of it. So when we actually see this, this modelling come out, let's publish it and let's have full transparency. I mean, what we... What we need is an open and honest debate and what we heard from the SNP benches was a litany of excuses as to how they, could, how they couldn't face up to the issue of taking an honest position on taxation. Now, I mean, in terms of the Tories, they clearly take a position of not supporting income tax rises and I think that is rooted uh, in a belief that they would quite gladly cut, uh, cut taxes back to the bare minimum, because they're not particularly interested in investing in the public sector. Uh, they see the public sector as something of a handicap, and that underpins their whole ideology. I also think that their argument is flawed in terms of uh, taxation not equal in economic growth. I think if you look at the recent survey produced by Technology Scotland, they make the point um, that there's, that there's a skills gap in Scotland and that we need to address that skills gap. And I would uh, genuinely argue that the way to do that is to invest more in schools and colleges to ensure, therefore, 
that we get more information technology and en engineering graduates out of those uh, colleges and universities in order to fill the skills gap and in order to raise more taxation to promote economic growth. In summing up, um, presiding officer, this is not only a debate about taxation, it's a debate about what sort of country we want Scotland to be. If we really want uh, to see a more passionate and a more dignified country, then we need to be prepared to make that investment in services and raise the taxation to make the difference. If we want to treat uh, our old people with dignity, if we want to see our youngsters have the opportunities to graduate from college and university and earn decent wages, and if we want to address the housing crisis, we need to face up to the decisions that are required for that. So support the Labour motion at five o'clock. Let's invest in our public services and raise the taxation to make that happen. And thank you. That concludes our debate on finance. The next item of business is consideration of two business motions. Motion 7778 setting out a business programme and motion 779 on an extension to a stage one timetable. I would ask anyone who objects to say so now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move both motions. Formally moved. Thank you very much. Uh, no one has asked to speak against the motions. Therefore, the question is that motions 778 and 779 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. The next item of our business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 7780 on designation of a lead committee. And I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion. Moved. Thank you very much. We turn now to decision time. And I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Derek Mackay is agreed, then all the other amendments would fall. So the first question is that amendment 7750.4 in the name of Derek Mackay, which seeks to amend motion 7750 in the name of Alec Rowley, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 7750.4 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes, 61, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And I'd remind members that if the amendment to the name of Murdo Fraser is agreed, then the subsequent amendments would fall. The question is that Amendment 7750 in the name of Murdo Fraser, we seek to amend the motion in the name of Alec Rowley on finance. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 7750.1 in the name of Murdo Fraser is yes, 30, no, 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Patrick Harvey is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie would fall. The question is that Amendment 7750.3 in the name of Patrick Harvey, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Alec Rowley, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment 7750.3 in the name of Patrick Harvey is yes, 6, no, 58. There were 60 abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is the Amendment 7750.2 in the name of Willie Rennie, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Alec Rowley be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 7750.2 in the name of Willie Rennie is yes, 5, no, 59, abstentions, 60. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the next question is that motion 7750 in the name of Alec Rowley on finance be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 7750 in the name of Alec Rowley is yes, 33, no, 30. There were 61 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The final question is that motion 7780 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on designation of a lead committee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move to members' business in the name of Linda Fabiani on fighting for tax jobs and tax justice. We'll just take a few moments to change seats. <laughs>